Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Now, some of you may know and many may not, but I'm not just a YouTube creator. I'm a working internal medicine physician. And today in CNN and other news sources, I came across a story that I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss with you. YouTube is rife with videos done by people that have very little understanding of diseases or public health or the morbidity and mortality associated with common childhood diseases. They claim that vaccines are dangerous somehow, uh, they're somehow linked to autism, and they actively encourage people not to get their children vaccinated. I think that we need to take a moment and have a look and see what happens when that actually occurs. Now, in Samoa, which is an island uh, with a population of about 200,000 people in the Pacific, they had an accident at one clinic uh, not long ago where they improperly mixed a measles vaccination with something other than the dilutant that was required. As a result, two infants died. This is a tragedy and a medical error. But as a result of that accident, their vaccination rates went from 90% down to 31%. These are the headlines of the news right now. Deadly measles outbreak hits children in Samoa after anti-vaccination fears. Now, I want to show you something this, on this. Note the date, November 27th, 2019. 2,437 people became sick with measles and 32 have died. This is on November 27th. Look at this New York Times article from December 3rd, 2019. 3,900 cases. Now, do you see how quickly that not only increased in number of cases, but now there are 60 people dead. As of the CNN report this morning, that's up to 62. So let's take a look at the measles vaccine and see whether or not the fear of the vaccine should be replaced by the fear of measles. Well, let me introduce you to Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. She is a former nephrologist that has become a homeopath. She is at the forefront of the war against the measles vaccination. Now, I did a video on vaccine advice for parents last April, and surprisingly, the quality was pretty decent. So I think that I'm going to Put a segment of that video in, and I'll put a link to the original video in the description of this one. Let's go ahead and review some of this. Perhaps even worse than Andrew Wakefield is Dr. Suzanne Humphreys. She is a former nephrologist or kidney specialist that went into homeopathy. Dr. Humphreys wrote a book in the early 90s suggesting that vaccination was actually dangerous. Her ideas, although questionable, enjoy widespread traction in the anti-vax movement on the internet and YouTube. The first assertion that she makes is that morbidity and mortality from measles is negligible. Prior to the advent of the vaccination in 1968, 500 children a year died in the United States of measles and almost 50,000 were hospitalized due to complications. She also characterizes it as a mild disease, more of an inconvenience than a danger. She neglects to mention that one in a thousand patients with wild measles gets encephalitis. Other complications include pulmonary and kidney damage. As noted, even in non-fatal cases, nearly 50,000 people needed to be hospitalized a year before the advent of the measles vaccination. As the measles vaccination is an attenuated live virus, she asserts that people get measles from the vaccination. This is not true. They may develop a rash and a fever a week or two after the vaccination, but this is the body's cellular immunity getting to work. It is not the actual disease measles like a wild virus would cause. She went on to document 48 cases of encephalitis out of 75 million uh, amongst people that got the attenuated vaccine. Although she doesn't document an actual causal relationship between the vaccination and these cases of encephalitis, recall that the actual wild virus has an incident rate of one in a thousand for encephalitis. The point being made is that even if all 48 cases out of 75 million were caused by the vaccination, 
this is equivalent to the number of cases of encephalitis that would have occurred in the 48,000 people hospitalized a year prior to the vaccination. She also suggests that like the flu vaccine, vaccination against measles does not protect people against all strains. While it is true that there are 19 specific genotypes of measles virus, there is only one serotype, and the vaccination works against that serotype, providing lifelong immunity. The measles vaccination also promotes both antibody and cellular immunity. Dr. Humphreys even goes as far as to suggest that antibodies themselves are harmful, citing something called antibody-dependent enhancement. While this does occur in some rare diseases like dengue fever and HIV, it's not been shown to occur in any of the vaccine-preventable diseases. Immediately after discussing the harm that vaccine-induced antibodies can create, she promotes antibodies in breast milk as an alternative. Antibodies are antibodies, be they produced in your body or you get them in breast milk, and the breast milk antibodies do not induce an antibody response in the child. They are essentially protective while the child is nursing. She then goes on to recommend vitamins as a viable alternative to vaccination. Now, for a disease that is as benign as Dr. Humphrey seems to think this is, let's look at the effects of measles in Samoa. They have shut down all government services and schools. They are restricting movement of people on the streets, instructing them to stay at home, awaiting vaccination teams. Homes that are not vaccinated have red flags placed in front of them so the teams can stop there and vaccinate all the members of the family. This has shut down this entire community. It's killed 62 people, 50% of which are under the age of five. Now, is this isolated to American Samoa? No. 140,000 people a year die of complications of measles. What are those complications? One in a thousand cases of measles gets encephalitis. All right. One in 20 develops pneumonia. There were 40,000 to 50,000 hospitalizations of children a year in the United States alone before the advent of the measles vaccination in 1968. Now it's almost unheard of, except in communities that don't vaccinate against the measles. We have an outbreak of measles here in my home state of Michigan. 43 cases of measles have been confirmed. They're mostly down in the Detroit area, but one of the people with the disease was confirmed to have visited spots in Grand Rapids and Lansing. And as a result, we're seeing some spread. You see that? In addition to measles, we have outbreaks of other infectious diseases due to low vaccination rates here in Michigan as well. Hepatitis A, very significant, 900 plus cases. Pertussis, in Traverse City, Michigan, shutting down schools. There were over 167 probable cases of pertussis and over 20 confirmed cases. Now, vaccine hesitancy has been identified by the World Health Organization as one of the top 10 public health risks to the world. Now, why do we have vaccine hesitancy? Let's have a look at a couple of reasons. In preparing this presentation, I reviewed an article by Eve Dupay on vaccine hesitancy. There's a link to it in the description. Her opinion, which I share, is that vaccine hesitancy is not an educational issue. People accept or question vaccination based on a number of factors, and in order to increase vaccination rates, we need to address all of those factors, and I'd like to go over a few of them. But this particular slide bears mentioning. Outbreaks of vaccine-preventable diseases are tied to non-vaccinated or under-vaccinated communities. An example of this was an outbreak of pertussis that we had at a charter school here in Michigan last year. There was a very high percentage of unvaccinated children at that school, and some 20 or 30 of them got pertussis. After the initial case came in, the rest developed pertussis in a mini-epidemic. 
Vaccine hesitancy is a serious enough problem that the World Health Organization declared it as one of their top 10 priorities for 2019. Painting parents in broad strokes, we see that we have acceptors. We have people that accept some vaccines but not others. We have people that deliberately delay vaccination until they have to have them. And then we have people that refuse all vaccinations. Dubé looked at some of the decision-making factors from parents that were not vaccinating their children or delaying the vaccination or partially vaccinating their children. And here they are. Let's go over them one at a time. The first is the parent's knowledge base, and this is the classic reason for not vaccinating children with a twist. They found that the parents that had the highest rates of vaccination knew the least about the diseases and the vaccinations. Their attitude was predominated by, let's trust the experts that have the actual training to do this to help us make these decisions. Parents that were vaccine hesitant actually knew more about the diseases and the vaccinations. Unfortunately, when lay people research technical and scientific issues like this, they tend to have a rather superficial understanding and tend to be rather peculiar in the sources that they will accept. In fact, in a controlled study, merely surfing anti-vaccination sites for 5 to 10 minutes increased vaccine hesitancy. After knowledge came past experience. Is there a family history of people having problems with vaccinations? Do people have adverse reactions to being stuck with a needle? What is the level of comfort and trust that parents have with their vaccination or healthcare providers, or even the staff at the clinics? Next is the actual understanding of immunity and health. I had immunology for several months in medical school, and I'm not sure I still understand it fully myself. I mean that people talk about antibodies, but there's actually five different types of antibodies, all of which do different things. It's a rather complicated subject. And then thanks to Dr. Humphreys and Wakefield, people have these myths that are out there on the Internet. Good hygiene makes vaccination unnecessary. That's not true. Vaccines weaken natural immunity. That's also not true. There's also a perception that having a vaccine-preventable disease makes your immune system or your body somehow stronger, and that too many vaccinations actually weaken your body's defenses against disease. Again, this tends to be confirmational bias. If you read this on a website, you tend to believe it, whether it's true or not, and you don't do the research to back it up. There are some legitimate questions in this field. And quite frankly, part of this presentation is to start a conversation between you and your provider so that maybe you can get some better answers. The analogy is, is that I could probably find a YouTube video that will tell me how to rebuild the transmission on a GMC Sierra truck. But there are people out there that actually do that for a living. And even if I was a do-it-yourself type of guy, I'd probably want their advice before I started. Never underestimate the value of healthcare provider input in this decision. People that are healthcare providers have degrees that people listen to. Dr. Humphrey and Wakefield played on their medical degrees to develop this following. Healthcare providers that recommend vaccination but refuse to get vaccinated themselves send a message to their patients. So do people like Dr. Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine. Before releasing the polio vaccination for nationwide testing, he injected his own family. What message did that send to the parents of America? When making decisions about vaccination, parents go through a decision-making process like any other major decision. What is the danger of the disease? What is the danger of the vaccination? Are there dangerous additives? The problem is, is that most people have never seen a vaccine-preventable disease, both patients and doctors. It's difficult to understand something that you have very little knowledge of. The other problem is that most of the people talking about this are in the anti-vax community. And people that do their research primarily from anti-vax websites are generally given either wrong information or severely confirmational bias information. A good example of this is the additives in vaccinations, the adjuncts. These are... Um, chemicals that were put into vaccinations to enhance the immune response. A good example of this is mercury compounds. Mercury compounds were removed from vaccinations years ago. 
However, because they were removed, somehow that makes them evil or bad or dangerous and somehow still present in vaccines. In reality, it was more of a manufacturing decision. Much of the vaccine hesitancy movement is related to trust. Trust of the doctors, trust of the public health and pharmaceutical industries, trust of the government. We all have our own part to play in this. I can't really do too much to help you trust the government or Big Pharma. However, by giving you good advice and taking the time to talk with you about it, perhaps I can gain some of your trust for me. And hopefully by gaining that trust, my words will have some weight in your decision. Finally, we have moral, religious, and personal convictions. People are strongly liberty-minded, or they're Jehovah Witnesses, or the Amish, or they believe in natural or alternative medicine. These are part of the makeup of people, and although we can address many of the other issues, it's very difficult to change a person's outlook on life. Now, an interesting report came out on CNN the other day about a clinic in, in Pittsburgh that put out a pro-vaccination video, just a short little two-minute video encouraging people to bring their kids in to get vaccinated. In a matter of a few days, they had 797 comments against vaccinations. In addition to categorizing the comments, they traced some of those posts back to almost 200 individual pages and looked at the characteristics of the posters. The posters fell into four basic categories, those with trust issues, those that promoted alternative medicine, those that had questions about the safety of vaccines, and people that promoted conspiracies. 89% were women. They represented 36 states and some eight foreign countries. Vaccine-preventable diseases are not harmless. They have complication rates, and they cause deaths. But even if you are lucky enough to just have a sick child that recovers, look at what effect this has on society. Schools are shut down. Businesses are shut down. Parents can't go into work because they're home caring for sick children. Folks, get your children vaccinated. Mine are vaccinated. Get yours vaccinated. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you for stopping by for a few minutes, and we'll get back to the silliness after we've dealt with a serious issue. Thank you for stopping by.